Rich, welcome back. Gary, so good to be back with you again. Yeah, yeah. So I'd love to start with a check-in. You wrote a book. When did that come out? When did The Deeply Formed Life come out? September of 2020. Yeah, September great timing. Perfect timing. Great time to launch <laughs> a book, right? And uh, the hurricane in the last few years, obviously you were finished it long before the pandemic hit. Yeah. That's how publishing goes. How is your soul? And I'd really love to know what happened to your soul over the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I think like every other pastor and leader, I think the last couple of years have been, I've been weary, honestly. I think the way I've tried to explain it is we're, we're living in a CPR world, a, a world in which there's this convergence of COVID, political idolatry, at least in the United States, and, and racial hostility. And so the convergence of these three things have made it hard to breathe. Uh, our hearts are ailing. And uh, I think that, in addition to the regular pressures of just life and leadership have been very challenging. Uh, within the congregation that I pastor, we've seen some significant shifts in terms of who calls new life home these days. And so uh, I have needed uh, a rhythms of friendship, uh, seasons of rest, and just ongoing inner work to kind of navigate the terrain of the last few years. But um, God has been gracious and uh, I'm experiencing lots of joy and peace, but it certainly has not been easy. Can we talk about the people who left? Because that is a huge theme. I mean, here we are two and a half years into this whole thing that we're in. And when I just have conversations with church leaders in particular, there's a lot of pain over the people who left. And I don't think there's a single church in America where, or Canada or the Western world where, you know, Everybody who was there is still there. And some people left mad. Can you talk about that? You know, I, it's funny because uh, before our conversation here, I had a, a meeting with a congregant on, on Zoom. And mm. thankfully, it was a good conversation. Yeah. Uh, but she raised the issue. She was very disoriented around the shifts she was noticing. She's been at New Life for 18 years and she just had some questions and she was feeling disoriented around the people that she wasn't seeing anymore. And I think for me, in our context, it came in three waves, in three waves. The first wave happened after the 2016 election, which just brought about lots of polarization and division. And I don't think I um, uh, contributed well in that season because I just had my own particular ideas about who our church would be voting for and why. And I think I alienated some people on social media by some mm. things I said, which was very a good lesson for me. But that was the first wave where some started trickling out. The second wave was uh, during the pandemic at the beginning of and mid middle point of 2020, where we have this pandemic, we have uh, uh, racial protests going on. And some folks were just wondering, how are we, you know, are we aligning ourselves ideologically and theologically with organizations like Black Lives Matter? And then folks started leaving then. The third wave, at least in our context, was after uh, January 6th. And I preached a message right after January 6th about our baptism. Who do we belong to? Where's our allegiance to? It's to Jesus Christ. And I mentioned that what I am noticing is that instead of being finding our allegiance in Jesus Christ, our baptism has been put in jeopardy by a number of things. And I named a few things. I named mm. cable news discipleship. I named corrosive racism. I named charismatic prophecies and conspiracy theories. Well, that didn't go over too well. Wow. <laughs> so, um, and so for some people in our church, they just, again, came to the conclusion that Rich is aligning. Although I, I said Jesus probably a hundred times in the sermon, it wasn't enough. Uh, and so there have been these waves of people coming and going. And then, of course, we have everything has been so politicized from masks. We did a survey, Carrie, multiple surveys, just where people are at. When are you ready to come back? And uh, we did about three, four different surveys, and it would be so funny to read the comments because right after each other, one person would say, um, I will be comfortable when everyone has to wear masks. And then the comment right after that was, I will come back when no one is wearing masks. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, 
Well, this is where we're at. So part of it, I just have to uh, recognize um, I'm not going to be able to please everyone. Uh, and as a leader, if I'm pleasing everyone, I'm probably not leading. Uh, but mm. those have been some of the uh, trends that I've seen over the last few years. Yeah, and we're getting a little bit of distance on it now, not that the polarization has magically gone away or anything like that. But do you mind sharing what happens to you on the inside? You know, wave one, wave two, wave three. Like what what happens to Rich? Yeah, I, I get very flooded. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I have difficulty sleeping. Uh, when, whenever I find myself experiencing this level of tension, I feel it in my body first, which is why at New Life, we often say that the body is a major prophet, not a minor prophet, mm -hmm. that our bodies speak loud. And I know something's going on when I can't catch a satisfying breath. I think that's when anxiety is getting the best of me. And so first of all, that's what's happening in me. Uh, my body's, uh, 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 you know, feeling the weight of this anxiety. Uh, but what I've tried to do b beyond just the ongoing rhythm of friendships that have sustained me over the past five, six years and regular meetings with other pastors along those lines, I have had to do significant inventory. So for example, after the January 6th message I, I preached, there was a significant member of our community who wanted to have a meeting because he wanted to raise some issues. And I started feeling, oh, and, he, and the person said, can we have a two hour meeting? I'm thinking, can anything good come out of a two hour Zoom <laughs> meeting? And I said, can we make it 90 minutes, you know? <laughs> and he said, fine. And I realized I was so anxious because this is someone I really respect. Mm -hmm. This is someone who's been a pillar of our, pillar of our church and I'm just not doing well. And so I remember going to, uh, walking down the block in Queens Boulevard in Queens and uh, had my journal and I began to identify and really ask God to help me. What are the lies that I'm believing about myself and about mm -hmm. leadership at this moment? And Carrie, I came across with six different messages that were deeply lodged in my soul that for whatever reason had not been named pr prior. And I walked into that meeting after spending about an hour, hour and a half reflecting on these questions and seeing them for lies, seeing the lies for what they were, that I was able to be fully present in that meeting. And no, my breathing did not return, the kind of satisfying breath did not return at that moment, it probably returned about a week later when my body got really acclimated again. But that's where I typically go. My And I think here's what's happened in me. As I've done that, Th those practices is not that I don't feel it anymore, but I don't go as deep in the hole as I used to. Mm. And it doesn't take me as long to come out of it as it used to. And so it's not that I'm a robot not feeling any kind of anxiety. I'm still feeling it in my body, but I don't, it doesn't last as long as it used to. That's the difference. Do you mind sharing one or two of those lies? Absolutely. Um, and you know what I'll do even better. I'll, 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 I'll pull up, uh, because I wrote it down, my, my journal here cool. okay. on, on, on lies that I was believing. So these messages that I was believing. And so uh, I'll just pull that up here. And maybe, Kara, if you want to just um, mm -hmm. edit it here so that it just comes across maybe a little, a little smoother. Oh, this um, is real time. This is, this is how real conversations happen. This is lunch. This is like, this is dinner. This is sitting around a fire with a friend. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm good with no edit if you are. All right, so so here it is. So I'll I'll put together. I just pulled it up right now. So Great. the lies that I I was believing about uh, myself here, and um, all right, here it is here. Because there were like seven of these lies, and all right, here we go. Okay, so the first one was this. When people disagree with me, it means I'm a bad leader. Number two, if congregants and I are not on the same page, I'm doing something wrong as a leader. Number three, I'm causing division by bringing up delicate issues. Number four, things will end in the worst way possible and it will all be my fault. Number five, I need others to like me for me to be okay. Six, I need others to agree with me for me to be okay. And then seven, people who leave new life expose my deficiencies in leadership. 
And I sat with those seven messages deeply lodged in my soul and began to one by one ask the Lord for some perspective. And I'll tell you what, um, I, that was so deeply lodged in my soul and I was able to name them. Something shifted in me hmm. uh, that I was able to be truly present with this person. And from that point on, I think it's just helped me to navigate some difficult conversations. Thank you so much for sharing that. You've talked about, you know, I haven't read it yet. My wife has, but The Body Keeps the Score. Um, mm -hmm. Millions of people have read that book. Uh, you're saying the body is a major prophet. I think there's a lot of truth to that. And I'm, I'm spending, as I get older, I'm spending more and more time listening to my body, paying mm. attention, trying to care for my body well or better. What, what symptoms or signs do you look for in your body for health or unhealth? Yeah, I think in my case, um, it, it begins with, again, the satisfying breath for me. I just know if I can't catch that breath there at any time that I need it, that there's something just beneath the surface. So that's and, simple, like literally breathe in, breathe out. How are you? You know, I guess for, for other people, it might, and you know, breath is just such an important part. Of <laughs> yeah, yeah, without it, we're, we're kind of done, aren't we? Yeah, good point. Uh, but, so I just, I just know that. Uh, I also know um, physically, I, I would have these physical, whether my fingers would get these allergic reactions often mm. to stress. And so whenever they, they would come up just a, a level of dryness on my fingers and I would go to it, uh, I remember seeing my, my doctor and one of the questions was, are, are you stressed? And I say, yeah, of course I am. But what does that have to do with this on my, my hands? You know? And she said, well, I, a lot, it has to do a lot with it. And so, uh, I, you know, our bodies are different, our, the chemistry of our bodies is different. But for me, uh, you know, my fingers uh, having these reactions, satisfying breath, racing heart, uh, sleepless, having difficulty sleeping at night. Those have been some of the symptoms for me that, you know what, I better pay attention to my soul and invite some others into this to help me just navigate what's happening in my body. I think that's so wise, you know, and I think back over my leadership, there are times, it doesn't happen very often, but I remember one season where I broke out in a whole body rash, my whole torso, you know, chest and stomach were red, kind of looked like I had not chicken pox, but you know, some kind of <laughs> tropical disease. And it was just stress. We were going through a staff transition at the time, which is always the worst for me. I think that's really, really important. I'd love yeah. to shift in gears a little bit, talk about what I call the the rot or decay at the center of the church. I mean, I honestly wish we had one or two scandals revealed and that was it. Everybody else was healthy. You know, nobody got abused. Nobody, nobody mm. got hurt. Nobody. But, but we, we are dealing with something I just thought we'd never see the day of, which is scandal after scandal. And I'm not upset that they're being brought to light. I'm just upset that so much rot seems to be at the core of Christian leadership or darkness where there should be light. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on sort of the season we're in, in the Western church these days? Yeah. Like you, Carrie, I, I'm, I'm burdened on the number, I'm burdened on what's happen, happening in the church and then what's happening in the world. It, it was the case where in, in public worship on Sundays, after our singing portion, we typically have a pastoral prayer about mm -hmm. something that's happening in our nation, in our world. And maybe once every four to five weeks, something would happen that we would pray. It seems like every week we're praying for something new that's happening in our nation, in our world, right. the intensity of it. And I think the same applies to what's happening in the church as well, the, the, the rot, the, what we're seeing in terms of leadership. And so I'm so burdened by it. And without trying to oversimplify too much, I, I think we have seen how unwell Christian leadership is for, I can think at least three or four different reasons that I mm. reflect on on a regular basis. The first is that I think we have leaders who have not seen their personal formation as their primary task. Uh, that, that so many leaders have never engaged in sincere confrontation with themselves. And so, you know, when I became the lead pastor at New Life Fellowship, I remember my predecessor, Pete Scazzaro, saying, we have to change your job description to make it more um, 
succinct in that the first line of your job description is for you to have a life with God. That's the first task of you, not to cast good vision, not to preach good sermons. And so on my job description is written, have a, in our language here, a contemplative life with God, that my life is marked by prayer, examination. So that's the first thing. I don't know if the leaders we're seeing have really taken their personal formation as their primary task. Uh, Secondly, I would say that I think we've adopted a very worldly approach to leadership, always believing that bigger is better, that increasing in influence is always a good thing, the idolatry of money and success. And so I think it's a very worldly approach to leadership. Um, Thirdly, I'd say we haven't looked to Jesus as the model of leadership. You know, when I think of the temptations of Jesus in the the wilderness, you know, Henry Nouwen has written a lot about this, where he says the three temptations that Jesus faces as he, after he gets baptized, is the temptation to be relevant, spectacular, and powerful. Mm -hmm. And every time Jesus says, no, I'm not going to turn this this stone into bread, that's what Nouwen says is relevance. I'm not going to jump from the temple and have angels catch me. That's an act of being spectacular. And I'm not going to bow at you so that at your feet so I can maintain power and have all power. Hmm. And so the way of Jesus has resisted the way of the spectacular way, the powerful way, and the relevant way, and the most crass way of understanding that term. Uh, And so I, I think, I don't know if Jesus has been truly our model. And then lastly, what comes to mind is, I don't know if leaders have taken seriously sin and powers and principalities as it finds himself in larger institutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I remember when I wrote my first book, The Deeply Formed Life, I asked my predecessor, Pete Scazzaro, to give me some words of encouragement and words of advice. And what he said to me angered me so much because he gave me everything that I wasn't asking for. And so basically the third sentence he said to me was this, Rich, if you do this, if you write this book, I want to tell you, your soul is in danger. <laughs> and, so, and so I'm like, Pete, this is not what I was asking for. Yeah, I was yeah, yeah. For, it's like, I was you know, write for. a really good introduction, Rich. Like, uh, <laughs> here's some three keys to a great introduction, right? That's what I was looking for. Uh-huh. He said, your soul is in danger. And I thought, he says, you're going to be involved now with institutional power in, in publishing, in the publishing world, in the larger world, as your name gets more out there. And so for about 30 minutes, he just told me why my soul was in danger. And I wrote down so many notes from that conversation, because what I think I learned in that was I need, I need to take seriously the reality of sin as it is manifested in larger institutions. And so when that's not the case, uh, I, when, I think when we are not mind, and as Christians, we, should, we have a lexicon for sin. We have a lexicon for the larger spiritual realities in our world. We should be the first ones to say, whoa, our soul might be in danger here. So I think because of, I think the rot flows out of at least some of these ideas that I've been thinking about. Yeah, so looking back on it, where and how was Pete right? Well, he was right in a few ways. One, he said to me, you're going to be very tempted to now use your platform at New Life to further your own brand. Hmm. And that was one of the first things he said. You're going to be very tempted now to not pastor these people, but to now leverage them for your own purposes. And that's... uh, and you know what? He's absolutely right. That's been a very real temptation in my soul. And I've had to work really hard to do counter instinctual things to make sure I am rooted within a smaller community, to make sure I'm spending time with people who cannot further so-called my influence and my brand, so-called, you know? Um, And so he's been right along those lines. He's also been right in that, you know, at the end of that conversation, his parting thoughts to me after, you know, 45 minutes of your soul is in danger. He said to me, and you know what, Rich, your book is going to do really well and it's going to help a lot of people. And then he just left the room, you know? (laughs) And I was like, thanks. You know, you could have started with that, uh, but you didn't. Uh, And I've learned that because of the level of now 
let me just say what it is, just influence that I have that I didn't have before the book. Uh, there are a lot of temptations out there that I didn't have before to be spectacular, to be powerful, to be relevant. And uh, I, I think everything he said, and I, I, I mean, I have about four pages of notes uh, because he experienced it himself. So he was really speaking out of a place of firsthand experience, not theory. So, I, I mean, the seduction to power is very real. Yes, it is. So let's play the other argument. And, you know, you have gifts of writing and obviously you've been granted a certain amount of influence uh, as a result of your ministry, but also your book and, you know, this new one that we'll talk about before we wrap up today. So the alternative is Rich is worried about his soul. He doesn't write a book. He doesn't make a contribution to the wider community. You pull yourself off the speaking circuit. You withdraw yourself from social media and you go about, go about the meager, anonymous job of pastoring a local church in New York City, which could have, you know, tremendous impact, not only for this generation, but future generations. You know, is that more faithful? I guess what I'm trying to ask, because I'm in the same boat you are, right? Yeah. Similar. <laughs> it's like, there's a lot of influence these days. And I'm having a really interesting dialogue with a young 20-something leader who's like, I think I'm pulling back from all this. And I'm like, it's a really interesting conversation. Like, should everybody just say, hey, we're killing the publishing industry, we're, we're done, we're withdrawing from social media, and we're becoming the new monastic movement? Like, what, what is the answer? Yeah, and you know, monast I mean, monasticism is something that has formed me deeply. As a matter of fact, our first M at our church, we have these five Ms, is monastic. Yes. And so uh, it's something that I've been really formed by. You know, I, I think... I think that varies from person to person and some people might feel called to that. And I would not argue with them or try to convince them otherwise if they sensed that was what they were called to do, pulling back in that truly monastic way. But I, for me, I think it's a matter of more of to what degree is my influence being protected and guarded by a larger structure and system of relationships around me. Mm. Uh, and so in my case, for example, um, you know, I met with our board to talk about the maximum number of speaking engagements I can do in a given year. And that was very clearly defined and negotiated a little bit. And uh, so that was very important. I know some people that do an enormous amount of public speaking that I don't know how they're able to pastor a church. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to pastor a church. At the same time, I sense that God has called me to serve people outside of our local community. Uh, and so... Having a board, having a very strong wife, having a collection of friends that have really helped me to steward uh, where I'm at, for me, it has been the response. It's not a matter of it's either all in and act, acting like a crazy person or all, all out acting like a monk. How in the world can I steward what I believe God has entrusted to me in, in ways that are doing my soul good. I mean, I, I have weekly Sabbaths. I take good vacations. Um, I, you know, I have enough, you know, I have sabbaticals. I have good rhythms, but more than that, I think I have a pretty strong structure around me, primarily in the form of my spouse, our elders, and a small group of friends that have helped me to navigate some of this influence and increased impact that I'm having in the world. Yeah. And conversely, if we all retract to private life, we don't have Henry Nouwen. We don't get Thomas Merton. We don't get Martin Luther King Jr. We don't get any of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And what's, I, what's interesting about Thomas Merton is, and I'm a big fan of Merton, I've read so much of his books, is for a monk, he was doing quite a lot of traveling himself. Yeah, and yeah. so he was writing a lot and traveling. So, um, not all monks are just cloistered within the monastic walls, praying and writing. Some of them have traveled extensively like Merton has mm -hmm. or had. Yeah, I think my favorite Henry Nouwen book is The Genesee Diary. It's almost nobody knows that book, but I think it was his first or one of his first. And it's literally his diary from six or so months in mm -hmm. upstate New York, just upstate from you, in Genesee County. He's at this monastery and he's in the process of being pulled into this wider world of speaking and teaching and writing. And you basically see him wrestling for his soul in mm. the pages of the diary. 
It's fascinating. I think I'm going to read yeah. it again this summer. It's a reread for me. But Yeah, and it might have been that book or another one of his journals where he writes about two ministries that we need, that we need a ministry of presence and we need a ministry of absence, mm-hmm. that leaders need two of those. And and unless we are holding those two things together, there are times where I'm, I'm called to be present on social media and other places. And then time, there are times I'm called to be absent. But we need that both of those um, those words to help us navigate the increased amount of influence, power, whatever you want to call it, um, that can come our way. It's funny you mention institutions. And I mean, the church sometimes, particularly at a certain size, starts to feel like one but there's almost a, a a machine that needs to be fed, right? Mm. You're supposed to write a book every two years. You're supposed to speak at X number of conferences. And every once in a while, it's really wonderful to, well, regularly unplug from the machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, wow. Absolutely. Okay. So helpful. Um, I'd love to take it here. You look at the new exodus from church. So some of your people have left. Some of them went to other churches. Um some of them just went nowhere, right? I'm going to do individual Christianity for now or online exclusively, but not in community. What do you see as behind the new Exodus? Because I think most churches are down mm. 20 to 50% still in mid 2022. Yeah. A, f- a few things come to mind. Um, first thing I'd say is I think there's a number of people who have exited because of poor leadership. Hmm. Uh, because of the stories of abuse, the lack of integrity. And so in, in, in some respect, they're not returning because of the failure of discipleship and leadership and formation among leaders and institutions. And so I think that's one part of it. Uh, I think on another level, uh, it's a failure of discipleship in that our understanding of the church has been so myopic and lacking theological and sociological depth. And so, for example, when, when the church is seen as something you go to as an event, as a service, it, it's treated very much like how we treat Broadway in New York. Uh, you know, for a couple of years, I went to my first Broadway show in over three years, just in, in May for our daughter's mm-hmm. birthday. And while, I mean, I love Broadway, my wife and I love to take in shows, but I was not, my soul was not like, it's shriveling because I haven't been to a Broadway show. Hmm. Now, when I went there, it was, it was wonderful. But I think church is often seen as just another show that it's good to go to when you can. But if you don't go to it, it's all good. And I think part of that has been our theological formation around what is the church and what does it mean to belong to people. Uh, on a, and then additionally, I think the exodus has happened because Quite frankly, Christians, many Christians have understood faith through the lens of cultural values like individualism, consumerism, comfort, the frenetic pace of life. You know, Easter of 2022, uh, it was interesting because we saw so many new people yeah. come to our church and then so many people I haven't seen in two years come to the church. And so I started asking the people that I haven't seen in two years, go, where you been? And I appreciated the, the how candid some of them were, where they said, it's pretty nice to go to church in my pajamas. It's pretty nice to just have my coffee and on my sofa and all that. And I'm thinking, well, I think this is a problem of discipleship here, of how mm. are we seeing our engagement with the body of Christ? And so I think on some level, it is people leaving because of the failure of leadership. On another, it's just a failure of understanding what the church is from a theological and sociological perspective. And then another is, I think lots of folks have been discipled by cultural values rather than kingdom values. And um, I think that has that has led to all kinds of people exiting and not returning. So I think it's quite multi-layered. The story you're hinting at is a story I'm hearing anecdotally from almost everybody I talk to. I haven't seen good data on it mid-2022, but it seems to be that there's a a wave or waves of people who left. But 
it's not just, you know, I had 100 people, 50 left, so now there's 50. Maybe there's 70, but there's 20 new people, you know, or mm-hmm. 200 new people or 2,000 new people, depending on your multiplier. And it's really interesting. Any sense whether, you know, there's a whole new generation of people coming in or is that just transfer growth? Do you have a sense of where the new folks are coming from or why they're coming? It- you know, it's hard to really, I, I can answer for my context in Queens and New York City. Uh, and so this is what I've seen anecdotally. Um, I've seen a lot, many younger people coming to our church uh, in our context because they have seen the kind of integration that they were hoping for in terms of how the gospel connects to some of the larger cultural issues of our day. Uh, and I think some of the folks that have left have had a hard time with uh, how the gospel intersects with some of these realities of our day. And so uh, younger folks, I think, are coming to New Life now because they've heard me talk about how we're navigating through elections and race and sexuality and all these other things. And they're going, oh, okay, I think I, this is a place I want to be at that's helping me to see how the gospel connects to these realities. So uh, that's been my understanding, or at least what I've seen in my context, whereas the people who have not returned, I think are people that have seen the gospel more in a vertical way without all the horizontal dynamics that the gospel has implications for. So that's what I've seen in my context here. Well, that's an interesting spin, too, on younger millennials and Gen um, Z, who seem to want to know, like, where do you stand, you know, on everything from climate change to sexuality? Yep. They want a point of view. And it's interesting because that that same, you know, analysis you might provide would be a turnoff to a boomer or someone who's an older Gen Xer. Yeah. A very Which has interesting its, take. And it has its gifts and it has its shadow side. So so the gift no, is... About the shadow. Okay, gift and shadow side, yeah. The, the gift is we are being really thoughtful about integration. And we want to see how the gospel and the message of Christianity applies to all aspects of life. The problem then becomes when some of the issues that might not necessarily be uh, matters of essentials um, maybe there's secondary issues to life and faith, important, critically important, but mm. not to the degree that we're just going to, I'm out of this church now. Um, and I think with the emerging generation, listen, my daughter, she's 13 years old. She rebukes me every time I go in the car and drive. She goes, dad, you're killing the environment. I'm thinking, <laughs> do you want to eat or not? You know? so, <laughs> and so I think she has this penchant for justice and the environment and all that. Uh, but I think if, if not careful, the shadow side is I will now line up with anyone who sees everything the way I see it. Mm. And if you don't see everything the way I see it, um, there's something wrong with you. And I think that's kind of, in many respects, where we're at as a society. Well, and there are moments where the Christian narrative, more than a few of them, you know, is divergent from the dominant cultural narrative, mm-hmm. which a younger adult may have embraced. And there's nuance behind that. And we're certainly not necessarily always the opposite, but that's a that's a good description of <laughs> that. Um, there seems to be, you know, a generation, and I, I watch this with admiration. Yourself, John Mark Comer, your friend John Tyson, Sharon Hade Miller, and others, and that's just a partial list of leaders around the same age and stage who seem to be taking a very different approach than maybe. Uh, the people whose ministries you inherited would have, you know, I'm not talking specifically about Pete. I'm just saying the previous generation of pastors. Um, I would love to know, you know, in what are you seeing in this generation, your generation of pastors that might be different from their predecessors? Yeah. I, uh, I think a couple of things. One, I think we are seeing increasingly a generation of pastors who are, interested in what I just talked about, profound integration. Uh, and uh, to, to, to talk about the ways that the gospel connects with 
some of the larger cultural realities of our day. And so I think we're seeing more pastors who are becoming fluent in that, mm. recognizing the need for that in this kind of missional moment. Um, I also think we're seeing a generation of pastors who have taken seriously um, the inner life, our mental health, the effects of trauma, the call to justice. Uh, and so in, in short, I think, and I don't want to be disparaging about previous generation. That's the last thing I want to do. Yeah. But I think there are some pendulum swings mm. from generation to generation. And whereas previous generations didn't have maybe the, the vocabulary to talk about uh, mental health, the vocabulary to talk about integration in the way that is increasingly being heard today, I think generations of pastors today are providing more of that, which is very encouraging because I think the gospel is not just for a part of our lives or our spiritual life, I think that the gospel is for our entire life. And so I think what we're getting more at is a, a, a more holistic kind of pastor uh, that's trying to integrate the gospel in various sectors of human society and human life. Well, we need that badly. <laughs> you uh, wrote your first book, The Deeply Formed Life, came out a couple of years ago. And it was really, I guess, a reaction against shallow spirituality, shallow Christianity that didn't lead mm -hmm. people anywhere good, even whether they left the church or not. Your new book is called Good, Beautiful, and Kind. And I'm curious as to why you wrote this one. What What is it a reaction against or a, uh, a, 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 a an advocate for? Yeah, you know, the title, um, Good and Beautiful and Kind, comes from a poem from Langston Hughes, the African-American uh, poet. And he wrote a poem called Tired, which I think a lot of us can feel, you know? And he's, and here's the poem. He said, I am, I'm so tired of waiting, aren't you, for the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms are eating at the rind. And I remember reading that poem a number of years ago and returning to it. And I thought, this poem really gets at what's happening. And I think the angst and the longing that people have, we're longing for a good and beautiful and kind life. Mm. And yet there are some worms that are really inhibiting us from that. So let's, let's take a knife uh, and let's cut the world in two. And that language is not about division. It's more about depth. Mm. We don't need another knife to cut the world in two to keep people over here and over there. What he's getting at is more of a diagnostic approach. How can we identify the worms that are eating away at this kind of life? And so as I thought about the world we're in, the level of hostility, divisiveness, polarization, the lack of our the capacity to hold space with one another, what are the worms that are eating away at our lives that's keeping us from the, the good and beautiful and kind life that the gospel offers us in Jesus? And so that was really the impetus which flows out of my life as a pastor. You know, when I wrote The Deeply Formed Life, I wrote it primarily as a pastoral document. Now, mm -hmm. I'm grateful that it has gone beyond our uh, congregational context to reach other people, but I write primarily as a pastor. When I think about the people leaving our church, when I think about the people who are having a hard time holding space with one another, when I think about the level of pain we're seeing, for me, that's why I I wrote the book and the poem from Hughes really summarizes the book really in some good ways. Well, you raise a lot of issues in it. I mean, you talk about our failure to love, the paucity that passes for prayer, but you also talk about the three stages of relationships. I'd love to do a double click on that one. Um, can you explain them? It was really, you know, sometimes you see a, a framework yeah. and you're like, oh yeah, that's exactly what that is. But I never thought of it that way. Yeah, you know, the, the, I've tried to use some fresh language to get at kind of um, a, 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 an ancient kind of sociological reality. And so the three stages of relationships, this is how I see it. I see that there's what's called the heavenly stage, the hellish stage, and the holding detention stage. And so the, the heavenly stage is, I could tell when there's a new person who comes to our church. How do I know? Because they talk so glowingly about everything. You're the best you know, pastor I've ever had. You're the best oh, preacher I've I, ever I, heard. I'm the only pastor they ever had. You're the best pastor. Wow, you know? The, the, the people are so kind and everyone is so welcoming. And, 
And this is so wonderful. And I go, uh, how long have you been coming here? It's been less than a month, right? Because everything mm. is just so so heavenly. And this happens in romantic relationships as well. You know, you, you know, I meet people who just, uh, you know, what a man, what, what, how long have you known him? You know, just a week, I don't know his last name, but <laughs> wow, what an amazing guy he is. I'm thinking, well, you're in that heavenly stage. And it is at this stage where uh, I think it's natural, I think it's normal, but if we're not careful, we find ourselves being quite disillusioned because inevitably we're going to bump up against conflict. We're going to bump up against someone seeing the world very differently than we do. And when we come into a relationship or to a church, into a job with that kind of ideal, uh, idealistic uh, lens, now everything that comes against that is seen in extremes. And so it, it goes very quickly from heavenly to hellish, where people are no longer angels, but now everyone is demons. Mm. And every, people are demonized now. And, and I think at that point, this is when people leave the church. This is when people leave the job. This is when people leave the relationship because they think often if it's not heavenly all the time, something is wrong with this place here. Something's wrong with this relationship. As opposed to, no, it is quite normal to be experiencing all these things. So that holding the tension stage is the reality that we're not angels, but we're not demons either. Mm. We're somewhere in between. And this place is not heaven. Uh, neither is it hell, but it's somewhere in between. And the holding detention stage is uh, trying to name the idealism, the romanticizing that often gets in the way of flesh and blood, real community, that there's problems everywhere. And uh, I'm not talking about abuse. I'm not talking mm. about the extremes of it, but everywhere we go, we're going to bump up against some challenges. So those three stages have helped me to, at least for the people that I've led, uh, normalize the, uh, the different uh, seasons within relationships and community. I love that you talk about forgiveness because I think in our current culture, cancel culture equals zero forgiveness. I thought Douglas Murray did a fantastic job talking about that in his book, The Madness of Crowd Crowds, and you address it as well. What is like missing in cancel culture? I mean, there's just so much. And then how do we reclaim forgiveness? Yeah, what's, what's missing in a culture that cancels, um, and in some ways I, I see there's connection, and in some ways I see some difference here, because my, my first response to a, cult, a cancel culture would not necessarily be to go towards forgiveness first. Um, I think what's happened is... What would it be? I, I think more than anything, it is the tendency for people um, not to enter into the space of others, uh, the inability to be hospitable. You know, I, I was, um, there was a guy who wrote a book called Community. He, he's, uh, the name is slipping me, uh, not a secular book. And he said, hospitality is not just about welcoming strange people, but often also welcoming the strange ideas that they bring with them. <laughs> and that's hospitality as well. And I think we've come to a place where uh, there's very little room uh, for people that don't see the world as I do. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so we're very quick to uh, dismiss if they don't align theologically, ideologically, politically. Uh, and so I think what's required is the capacity to be humble, the capacity to be self-critical, uh, the capacity to be curious. I'll give you an example, Kerry. Yeah. 2020, the fall of 2020, we had, I don't know if you recall, there was an election between a guy named Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Okay. So I, I, I remember that candidates. vague memory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so four weeks before the election, one of our pastors sent me an email, 10, 8, 10 p.m. I, and I decided to open it up at 10 p.m., which is always a bad leadership move. Bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> and so I opened up the email and the pastor said, Rich, I have a great idea. What if we had this Zoom webinar where we can have 
some, two people from our congregation, one voting for Trump, one voting for Biden. Let's have them in conversation with each other to share why they're voting for e either candidate. And with great faith and courage, I said, we're never going to do that. Are you crazy? You know? And she said, aren't we the emotionally healthy church? I thought I, that, that was when Pete was leading this church. You know, that's it. We're in three day here. <laughs> and so she came back to me and pressed me a little bit further. And she said, what if we got two elders of our church to do it? I said, even worse, you know? So after a while, we, I said, yes. And a couple of weeks later, we had it, you know, 200 people showed up. And what I discovered from the two elders and the moderator was this profound sense of curiosity. And uh, I don't want to lump everything into our world with that curiosity will solve everything because truthfully, it, it won't. But yeah. I do think there is a level of curiosity that's just so missing from our world. And so this is what I was hearing in that conversation. I was just observing. I wasn't moderating. I was observing. I was hearing questions like, what are your deep fears around this issue? And why are you thinking about voting in this way? as opposed to you're voting for who, you know what, mm. you're never coming over for dinner. Uh, and so on that level, I, I just saw a level of curiosity and humility that I think goes a very long way in, in, our, in our culture that tends to uh, cancel very rapidly, particularly on social media. And I think that gets at a larger kind of sociological reality Reinhold Niebuhr wrote a book called Moral Man, Immoral Society a number of years ago where he said, he was basically making the claim that when we're alone, we have a level of morality. That's actually pretty good. But when we get in groups, good people that typically would be quite moral, something happens to them. And I think we see it in middle school playgrounds. We see it at political conventions. We see it on social media. And so on social media, there's a level of animus that is now multiplies because of the nature of that space, the, the, the depersonalized nature of that space, uh, the dehumanizing nature of that space. And so I think in, in some ways, uh, the cancel culture that we, we see in our world needs to be met with curiosity. But to your point regarding forgiveness, it, forgiveness is so layered. And, and what I write in the book, there was a, a, a guy named Matthew, uh, Matthew Lynn and Sheila Lynn, they wrote a book called Don't Forgive Too Soon. And I found their book to be so helpful to navigate the tensions of forgiveness because I think what, as Christians, we often hear, you need to forgive and forget and forgive immediately. And I think what often happens is when we live in that way, we have, you know, what I kind of call the, the, the resentment of forgiveness, hmm. that we forgive, but we, we, is, we're not doing it from a place of depth. We're not doing it from a place of reflection. And so what Matthew Lynn and Sheila Lynn do is they connect the stages of, they call five stages of forgiveness and they connect it to the five stages of dying. Uh, that there's denial, there's anger, there's bargaining, there's depression, there's acceptance. Hmm. And I just wonder in a world that doesn't know how to forgive, the, 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 the response to that is not greater willpower to forgive even better. I think it's better language to nuance forgiveness to recognize the anger, to recognize um, the hurt, and to then forgive out of a deeper place, a deeper reflective place, as opposed to, I just have to forgive because that's the Christian thing to do. I think a lot of people forgive because that's the Christian thing to do, but they're not giving thoughts to their forgiveness. And so as a result, there's something still lodged in their heart that's going to become a greater weight and, and burden and, and barrier to actually truly loving well. I really appreciate that analysis. Uh, what are you worried about for the future and what do you hope for the future? What gives you hope for the future? But we'll start with what you're worried about, if anything. I'm worried about a lot. Of, <laughs> I know I am. I am for sure. I'm worried about a lot of things. Um, I'm worried that uh, we... I just talked to the church that the church does not have the ability to live with the tensions uh, that are before us. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, I think in one of our previous conversations, uh, Carrie, I've talked about 
uh, differentiation, the ability to remain close to God, close to myself, and close to others in times of high anxiety, and resisting the polar opposite pull of cutting people off or being enmeshed into them. And I think because of our lack of the capacity to be differentiated in that way, uh, what we're seeing is the, the perpetuation of fractured lives and fractured relationships. And so how do we hold space well with one another? I'm very worried about that. Um, I'm also worried about the lack of theological integration as we think about large issues like race and sexuality and politics and justice. Um, uh, there is a way that the church is engaging it that can either be informed by a robust theological framework and biblical framework or just be swayed by the cultural forces of our day. And so I'm afraid for a generation that's coming that's not thinking through these issues theologically uh, and deeply theologically uh, and engaging from that place and are being swept within the cultural narratives of I'm supposed to think this way about this topic because that's what culture says. Uh, as opposed to how can I, I'm not talking about proof texting. I'm not talking about here's a Bible verse for that. I'm talking about a robust theological understanding about what it means to be human, what it means to engage in the world. And so I'm worried that the church is not equipped for that task. So probably those are the two things that really worry me about the yeah, future. I share that into our earlier conversation. That's one of the reasons I'm glad that you're not cloistered up in some basement, but that you're writing and, and contributing. Mm. Leave us with a word of hope. What are you most hopeful for as you look into the future? I am most hopeful. This is going to sound so pastor uh, cliche here, uh, but but I, I'm, I'm hopeful about Jesus Christ, Carrie. Mm. And... I think about what missiologist uh, Leslie Newbegin said, and I, I, I quote it every single Easter. Hmm. He says, I'm, I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. That's his statement. And yeah. when I look at the world, uh, it's, it's very easy in some ways to be pessimistic. And in some ways it can be easy to be optimistic about some positive things that we're seeing. Um, but I'm neither an optimist nor a pessimist. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And so I'm hopeful that Jesus cares about this world and this church much more than anyone else, and that Christ is committed to seeing the church and the world as a whole flourish. And so uh, that's my hope for the future. Hmm. Hmm. So well said, Rich. Thank you. Where can people find you these days online? Yeah, on social media, uh, which uh, I'm usually testing out a lot of my thoughts for sermons and articles and books, is just at Rich Velotis at Twitter and on Instagram. And then if they want to learn more about uh, writing projects, uh, such as Good and Beautiful and Kind, uh, they can go to richvelotis.com. Awesome. And the book comes out when? July 12th, 2022. And uh, very excited about it. Rich, thank you for contributing to the wider landscape. Thanks for staying grounded. And thanks for a really thought-provoking conversation. This will be a re-listen for me several times. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kerry. Thanks so much for watching the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. If you haven't subscribed yet, do so. Share it with a friend and leave us a comment. And I've got two things I want you to do before you sign off today. Number one, if you're a church leader, would love for you to go out and visit hegetsuspartners.com slash Kerry. Click on the link because here's what's happening. There's a $100 million campaign going on, basically sharing the gospel with the world. And if you become a partner for the He Gets Us campaign, here's what happens. People who are interested and respond to the ad get connected to your church. It's an opportunity for you to enter into dialogue, have a conversation with them, people who are really authentically exploring Christianity. So go to hegetsuspartners.com slash carry. And also, if you haven't yet checked out the Art of Leadership Academy, make sure you do so. The Art of Leadership Academy has over 150 high-quality, 
done for you resources for you and your team. Whether you're leading a church or whether you're leading a small business, you're an entrepreneur, it's done for you. I will train you in communication. I'll train you in team leadership. I'll train you in so many different things. We have PDFs, videos, downloads, cheat sheets, you name it, we've got it. It's ready to go. But it's beyond that. The Academy is also a community. I do live monthly coaching calls. We have an incredible community involved in daily dialogue. It is troll free and um, it's available for a very low membership fee every single year. Would love for you to check it out. Make sure you check out theartofleadershipacademy.com. Click the link and we'll see you inside there because here's why I started it. I graduated law school. Nobody taught me how to run a law firm. I graduated seminary and nobody showed me how to run a church. Had to figure it all out. So that's why we created the Art of Leadership Academy. It'll help you lead and help you thrive as you do it. Thanks so much for watching the podcast. We'll catch you next time. And I hope our time together today has helped you thrive in life and leadership.